Hello and welcome to Azure Databricks with Python, a deep dive. As they say on Kronos, the Klingon homeworld, kapla. And uh, in honor of that, I am drinking out of my Star Trek coffee mug. Or beer stein, whichever is in it. But this is coffee, trust me. All right, so um, my name is Brian Kafferke. I'm a data solutions enabler. I work at Microsoft. And I want to start with a little background because I always like to, the, the concepts in explaining anything are always more important than the syntax and things. If you get the ideas, everything else flows really easily. That's, that's the most important thing you can take away, this thing I've learned in programming. So this is a good slide to kind of frame things. Databricks is centered on Spark. You can't do Databricks without Spark. That's a good takeaway. Uh, the other thing about it though is the founder of Databricks wrote one of the founders of Databricks wrote Spark and they do a lot to maintain and enhance the open source side of Spark as well. Now what Spark supports out of the box without Databricks at all is a lot. It's it's a highly scale out architecture with, that supports inherently a fully ANSI standard SQL language. It has a scale out machine learning library which allows you to push your machine learning training to uh, the nodes it has Spark Streaming, it has a graphics API, and then at the bottom you can see it even lets you plug and play with different types of resource managers like Yarn, and by default I believe it starts, at least in Databricks, I think you get the standalone scheduler, but you get all these different things. So you get real-time processing, batch processing, and a graph API, everything. So it's got a lot of cool stuff, and that's just part of what you get in Spark. But you don't get Python. It's not supported out of the box in Spark, uh, or R for that matter. However, with PySpark, a package you can install as part of Python, you can install that, it's available freely, uh, it's open source, you can interact with Spark and get, use the Python language with Spark. And with R, you use Spark R or Sparkly R. So when you look at Databricks, I wanna kinda emphasize something here. On the right, you see the sort of underlying thing, the engine, what's really under the covers with Databricks, which is Spark. And that's free, that's open source. What you're getting with Databricks is what's on the left. You're getting a GUI-based portal with all kinds of functions and ease of use and, and a GUI that you can click, click, click and create clusters and have all kinds of dynamic features and security and all kinds of good stuff. So that's, th that's really what you get. And that's the difference between, say, something like just open source uh, Spark on site or in the cloud versus Databricks. So what do you get actually when you get Databricks? You get, as I mentioned, really easy cluster creation, an automatic turn off feature. You can say after 30 minutes or so of no use, turn off the cluster. And, you, and it doesn't go away per se, it's just uh, just pauses. You can restart it. You get, uh, it has actually built in sort of blob storage connected in the service, rate right local to you. You get security, you get scheduling, so you can schedule your jobs. You get a, a full, really powerful notebook. We're gonna use notebook environment, uh, Databricks notebooks, which are really just, it's your IDE, but it's a really rich IDE that lets us do a lot of data analysis. And we have large collaboration and security with Active Directory integration. So that's what you're getting with Azure Databricks. And I uh, just want to kind of highlight those differences. So the IDE, as I mentioned, is the notebooks. When we talk about Spark, we talk about scale out. And I have other presentations. I did one on Spark R, just the uh, last presentation actually, on Databricks. And that goes into more detail, more background. But I don't want to keep repeating myself. So I have other presentations and you please go and look at those. They do a more detailed breakdown uh, things. But when we talk about what's going on with scale out, what we're really talking about is creating multiple machines so that we can split up the work and have multiple sh multiple physical machines, if it's physical or it could be virtual machines, but they're all working on it concurrently. Parallel process, the cluster manager is, is the one that's gonna get the results back. It pushes out the request and it gets the answer back. And then that goes to the requesting program, the, the interface, the notebook in our case that established that Spark context, the connection into this, that created this whole, network of machines under the covers called the cluster. There's a few things that we need to understand about this. One is the Python code, if we're using Python, needs to be pushed, the program itself has to be pushed to each node. In scale out, what you do is you don't bring the data to the program, you bring the program to the data. It's a lot smaller than a petabyte, right? And if you have a petabyte of data, it's easy to move the program to it. And with Spark, typically you're talking about some sort of a, a single sort of 
single sort of task, like you're doing maybe a query of some type. And so you want to push that down. It's probably pretty small, but you need to push that Python code down to the actual nodes. And then the nodes will translate it into the API that can run it using the Java uh, VM, the JVM under the covers. So kind of taking another look at this, we can see that we've got Spark here and you've got the Spark core and that can read many different sources, Azure and, and open source sources, etc. And above that, and actually I relatively new, it was not part of the original Spark project, but it now supports a data frame API. So the data frame API has some advantages that I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but the nice thing is when you're using Python and R, you can use a native sort of look and feel, which are called data frames, and now that's supported within Spark. So it means that uh, it used to be we had to use something called resilient distributed data sets, and that was really our API and the way we worked in Spark, whether we were using Python or not. But now we can use like a, something very similar to Pandas data frames. It will look like Panda data frames. It uses the same syntax in most cases, but actually it's scaled out. So our data frame is actually spread across any number of machines. And so that's a really interesting thing you can do. And you can see that that data frame API is going to work against the Spark core. And essentially it's going to work against RDDs ultimately, but it's able to uh, optimize things as we'll see. The way you do it in Databricks is there's a library function. And I don't know if I did a video on this yet. If I didn't, I'll have to put that on my list of things, but there's uh, certainly help online. And you can go in and I'm pretty sure I did do a video on this and you can install libraries. So if you want to bring in libraries that are not there, most libraries are already available, like Pandas is already there and stuff. So you probably won't need it in PySpark, of course, is there. But if you do have certain proprietary ones that you can't find, you can you can install it from PyPy going into the library feature within Databricks. So I want to talk about this a little more because originally, when I first started looking at Spark a while back, um, I was really excited about it and thought this is a really cool way to do things but it was all centered on resilient distributed data sets. Now under the covers, it still is RDDs under at the very base, but there's a layer of abstraction that's been added, which thank you people who wrote this, the Spark Databricks people, whoever wrote this uh, part or came in the idea, because the idea of data frames on top of it gives a lot of benefits. And I, it's really amazing to me because not only is it easier to use, but it also performs better as we'll see. So originally you had to do all your programming against these resilient distributed data sets, um, which, was still very powerful and still a lot easier than trying to do something like MapReduce within Hadoop, but still also a little awkward because it, it was like you're kind of trying to pull data out and then work with it and then push it back and stuff. So it was a little different. Um, the data frame support, I was trying to figure out exactly when, I think it's around 1.4. I could go through all the documentation. I just looked back a little bit, but somewhere in the 1.x it was added. I know by 1.6 they added data frame support and, and 2.0 and above is like very heavy data frame. So at this point, if you haven't got legacy code to worry about, just go with data frames as much as possible. You can also do the RDD types of functionality, but it doesn't actually perform as well and it's harder to read and understand. So now we can have that native language paradigm look and feel that we know and love with pandas and Python. And uh, it's easier to read, which is nice, but oddly it performs much better. And the reason it performs much better is because one of the reasons for the SQL support and the whole data frame support is that the engine in Spark needs information to be able to sort of performance tune and optimize what it's going to do. RDDs, the way they were originally written when you were interacting with them, don't have much information. And I got this from a presentation by somebody at Databricks, so I'm just reiterating what they said, but it makes sense. They don't have a lot of information to go on, right? What do you want to do? How, do, how should I do it? Are you trying to join things? You're trying to filter? If it has enough information, it knows you're trying to filter, it knows what columns you want, it knows more details, then the, en the Spark engine can optimize what it does and makes it more efficient. It could even do things like push some of your query into, say, the source system. If you're querying something like Cosmos DB, for instance, in Azure, that's a very scalable, uh, scale-out architecture itself. So you could push things, for instance, into that if it understood more about what you're doing, but also just knowing what columns you need, et cetera. So what happens under the covers if you make your request in, say, Spark SQL, or you do data frames, which it will translate into SQL requests, what's going to happen is now it knows what columns you want because SQL is something that can be optimized. You can performance tune it. 
all the relational databases you think about, whether it's SQL Server or Oracle or Postgres or MySQL, have optimizers. And they can do that because the select statements, et cetera, actually are parsable, that you can break them apart and say, oh, I see a train to join, I see a train to sort, et cetera. And because it knows that, it can then create what they call query plans, and then it can optimize the query plans, and then essentially it's writing a little program on how to retrieve the data. That's what data frames give you, which is why data frames perform a lot better because they give the Spark engine a lot more information about what you want to do and, and the intention behind it. So we're going to focus, the takeaway of all this is I'm going to focus really on the data frame API and very little on the, uh, the, the what I consider to be more legacy, still valid, usable, but the RDD approach because it doesn't generally perform as well and it's not as intuitive. So I want to focus more on the Python side of things with data frames. And the overall architecture, as you can see, again, kind of emphasizing this is you've got the Spark engine and above that is the Scala Java API. And that's why Scala and Java can work very nicely directly against Spark. Uh, but when you want to use R or Python, then you use a library or package to go with it that gives you functions that translate to the API. So when you use R or Python, it's actually going to, under the covers behind the scenes, it's going to translate what you want into the API and make the calls against Spark. And Sparkly R is something also out there now that's uh, sort of also doing what Spark R does. There's some overlap. Uh, some competitiveness there maybe, uh, but they, they have some functionality. Sparkly R is, is particularly focused on the sort of uh, dplyr R and the tidyverse type of capabilities. So what does the Spark API do? So a lot of things here. We're going to get into the demo, I promise, but I do like to give the background. First thing is Spark is all in memory. As much as possible, Spark brings everything into memory, which is why it's so fast. So one of the things we can do with the API is point to data sources, whether it's CSV files or Cosmos DB or something, and we can ingest it. We bring it into memory. That's the first key. Once it's in memory, we can read, manipulate, and do things with it. We can do a lot of data wrangling, and it's scaled out at that point. And we can, of course, push the processing to the nodes. That's key. That's scale out. But if we don't want to, we can also bring data back to the head node, to a local single machine. You need to do that if you want to use the open source library. So if I like, you know, RGGplot2, I want to use something like scikit-learn or something locally, then I need to or matplotlib comes to mind as well, and I think I have an example of that, then I need to bring the data back to a single data frame, something that can be handled and understood by the open source libraries. But to the extent I want to scale out, then I need to use those scale out libraries. And the idea of all of this is with this API using these uh, packages or modules, I can interact in a way that feels natural to the language I'm using, in this case, Python. This just gives you an example in this slide. Three different implementations of some statements in Spark, Scala, Java, and Python. So these are ways that I could do the same thing essentially in three different languages. And this particular syntax is, is not something I'm gonna be using this specifically, but it shows you that it's not that different because underneath the covers, the library in Spark is the same, uh, but the language syntax does change depending on what language you're using. Excuse me. So what do we get? with the PySpark. I have I have an error on my slide. Uh, should say PySpark. I got Spark R because I slide I kind of copied and reused. Uh, but this works out well anyway. But in the PySpark, what do we get? Well, if you look at the bottom, you got the Spark Core. The perfect API gives you access to everything available in the Spark Core. And right above that is the RDD. So that's your primary interface to working with the Spark engine is your RDDs. So when you're doing data frames, or whatever, you're actually going ultimately against those resilient distributed data sets. And you have this sort of higher level set of libraries that you can interact with to get work done. So above these is Spark SQL. So Spark SQL Engine, which is a lot of what we're going to be talking about today, is a sort of library that rides on top of the RDD, which rides on top of the Spark Core. Uh, but Scaling Out Machine Learning is another library set. And then you have Streaming and the Graphics API, the Graphics uh, sort of modeling interface. And above that, you've got data frames and data sets and the SQL piece of it, the APIs above it with the SQL language, et cetera. And you can see here, then you've got, you know, Spark ML is sort of above the two of these, kind of crosses some of these. The big part, takeaway is if you look at the very top, Scala and Java implement everything because that's really kind of what everything's built on. So Scala and Java complete everything. Python's pretty good too. I don't know that it covers everything that Scala and Java have, 
but it's probably pretty close. It has a lot of functionality. It covers a lot of the machine learning scale out, etc. Spock R, and this, di this is a bit of an old slide, uh, started out kind of slow, and it only supported the Spark SQL side of things. So you could do data wrangling, and that was it. It's gotten a lot better, though. It's been impressive to me how much it's come along. And in the recent uh, times, it's now covering a lot of ML lib, et cetera. They've added a lot of functionality. So it's moving along. Bottom line, though, is you're probably better off with Python. Between R and Python, it, you probably want to use Python to some extent, even if you're an R user. I think you're going to find places where Python's going to really help you. Or you can use Scala and Java. So Python's really the, the and this is, I'm, I'm working on another presentation because Python has become sort of the ubiquitous language across many different domains and big data and data science is one of them. A few more words and then we go into the demo. When we talk about data wrangling at scale, we're talking about sort of scaling out SQL, data wrangling. But when we want to do machine learning training, that's a little different. Machine learning training is something where we're saying, I want to run a linear regression model. And if I'm trying to partition the data among a thousand machines, it's kind of tricky because if I push the model out, it's a hairy operation to think that it may need data from all of these data sets to properly create the statistical model required. Um, so scaling out machine learning is not the same as scaling out uh, data querying and analysis or wrangling. What it means is that, and, and here's the takeaway, open source machine learning libraries like scikit-learn and, and things like that don't scale. They only work in a single machine, and if you give them multiple CPUs, et cetera, they won't do parallel processing. So they have input data size limits, which is typically limited by the machine you have. They're not going to page memory in and out to get more. They don't support parallel processing, and they're not multi-threaded. The bottom line here is you're going to have to change the libraries you're using. And this is pretty significant. I'm not really a data scientist. I'm more of the operationalizing side of things. But if you are a data scientist, you probably have certain models in Python you like. If these are my favorites, they're my go-tos, they work really well. If you want to scale out your training, you're going to have to change it. You're going to have to say, I got to scrap that model and go to something in MLlib or something like that. Now, if you don't want to, you don't necessarily have to. If you can reduce the data size, maybe by aggregation and filtering or, or sort of splitting it up some way and bring the data back to the head node, you can use local open source functions on it whatever you like to use and you're still good to go you can do that and I think in many cases that's not a bad idea probably not the best thing when you get into these deep learning neural networks but if you're doing something that more traditional and less uh, require that large volume you may find that all you really need to scale out is the data wrangling end of it and you can still do locally the open source learning so that's my recommendation there but if you do just bear in mind the open source libraries will have to get replaced if you want to scale out your machine learning training Okay, so I've got this notebook set up, and this is a notebook that I got off Databricks somewhere and I, I downloaded. I've tried to reference uh, people, people's uh, things I borrowed in here as much as possible. I try to credit people. I don't have the link specifically where I got this, so people find it, feel free to post it. I don't have the exact thing. I may have actually got it internal somewhere at Microsoft where they posted it to, to kind of demo to people. But the idea of this one is it's a sample notebook. And you can see notes here. And if you're not used to notebooks, uh, what you have here is like cells. And the beginning of each cell has tells you what type of cell it is, what's the code in there. And markdown means it's it's a document. It's basically meant for documentation annotation. So you get this text. Uh, Shift Enter will execute the cell and move forward. I should do Control Enter. That will stay local. So we're going to do a little thing. I'm in the healthcare segment. That's why I really like this. And what I'm doing is what's the problem? Giving a diabetes data set, which is publicly available, we want to see if we can um, infer different patterns that influence the outcome. Can we predict diabetes outcomes based on just using public data? So the hypothesis is we can use the data to predict who is a highly likelihood of being susceptible to diabetes. Who's gonna get diabetes early? Who's likely? Um, and so we're gonna look through this and it's kind of cool. So we're gonna use a publicly available data set. Now I modified this notebook pretty extensively because I really want to demo different features of PySpark and things. And this didn't, that wasn't the goal of this particular demo, but there's a link here you can follow in the notebook. And this notebook is available on my github.com slide. So go to github.com slash B cap key slash shared. And you'll find all this stuff. And I've got the slide here. I'll post it in the YouTube notes as well, but you got this link here. And here's some credit here. 
And now this is a great reference and I borrowed a lot of examples from this notebook, so thank you there. So follow that. And there's just a lot of good stuff. There's a lot of good documentation out there and uh, don't ignore Spark documentation as well because as I said, it's all Spark at the end of the day, so you can use a lot of that. So first thing we're gonna look at here is getting data in. How do we do that? Well, I've got some data here and we can use it this way, but I wanna walk you through a little bit like if you wanna bring data in, you can go to this public, click this link, that'll bring you to the publicly available data set. So let me walk you through the steps here. So I click that and here I am. I'm just gonna say right mouse click here now and say save as. And I can then say save as, I'm not gonna bother saving, I've got one already here, but I can save the data set and then it's ready to use. So that's how easy that is to, to get going. Okay, so I had to wait for the cluster to start. But let me go back now to showing you how to bring data up. So I'm gonna just go in here and you can see I've uploaded data. So I can bring the data set in once I've saved it. Uh, browse here, find the data set, in this case, diabetes. Click okay. And then click on create table of the UI. You can do it in a notebook. I like this better. So we're gonna just try, just as a quick and dirty, this is how you can get in and get it set up. You have to load it to a cluster. So then you can say, pick your cluster, preview table. Now it's gonna to wanna to put it, it automatically puts the CSV at the end. I can call it one, two, three, just to kind of demo this. You can create databases. I'm gonna use only the default. I don't have multiple databases set up here. And I can say first row is header. Now this data set is small, so I can also use the inverse schema. If you've got a petabyte of data, probably not a good idea. Uh, maybe you wanna do something with, use a small subset first to get the definition, or just go through and you can define it yourself. Once I've got this done, all I have to do is say create table. And I've got this now diabetes one, two, three available, all right? And you can see it gives me a little bit of example, shows me what data types, is, et cetera. So I'm gonna go into my PySpark demo here. And just to kind of show you, you know, how this works, this was what I had. I'm just gonna make a slight change. I'm gonna say one, two, three to demonstrate that that table is now available. And that means it's defined to the SQL engine. It's created metadata about the CSV file, which means I can treat that CSV file just like it was a SQL table. Now remember, it's pulling it all into memory anyway, so it's giving it meta descriptions, you know, column names, types, et cetera, as you saw. And if I uh, just run Control Enter in this case, it'll stay local and it'll see what it can do. So you can see it stumped the data out. So that's the takeaway I wanted to get you. So that's how quick and easy you can get up started. You can play with this notebook. You can bring the data in. I don't want to leave you so that you're like, how do I use this? So that's all you have to do, and you can run this riveting notebook yourself. So one of the things I'm going to do here is I'm going to demonstrate the first thing in SQL, which is a little around the pot of Python. And there's a reason for this. If you're a big Python person, I highly recommend you don't restrict yourself just to Python, especially SQL is good to use. SQL is built into Databricks it, and Spark, very performant, and it gives you a lot of really easy to use functionality that's probably a lot easier than Python in certain cases. Uh, one good case is that because it's SQL, it's easy to create permanent persisted SQL tables within Databricks. Um, so here I'm creating a new table and one of the things I really don't like, if you're a SQL developer, you learn to hate spaces in column names. They drive me crazy because they really make it painful to work with the data. You always have to put special things around them. Spaces are typically delimiters in programming languages and, and definitions, etc. I know users love them and they look great on labels, but save them for your labels. I never put them into column descriptions, column names, etc. So what I'm gonna do here is remove the spaces. I've got, I'm gonna use them here to define it, but then I'm gonna rename it with this. So give them no spaces. <clears throat> so what I'm doing here, you can see I'm, I'm taking my original diabetes data set and I'm gonna create a new table and say pregnancies is fine, but I wanna get rid of the space here and here and create a new table. Now, I think this table exists, so I may get an error here. And it tells me it already exists, but that's all you'd have to do. And now that it does exist, let me just show you how that looks. And you can see Spark is running. So this is all scaled out, any number of nodes. I have a pretty small cluster. But now you can see I've gotten rid of all those spaces, which makes it a lot easier for me to refer to column names because I don't have to keep putting quotes around it. Um, all right, now we've had fun with that. I'm gonna show you another way to rename it the, using the PySpark method. And you can see this is in fact a Python notebook. 
What that means is if I don't label the type of cell, it's going to automatically assume it's Python and execute it as a Python cell. So here I'm using the spark.read.csv, which is a PySpark function. It's part of PySpark, okay? All right, yeah. And I'm gonna tell it to create a data frame. And I'm gonna say SDF, so I know it's a Spark data frame. Because when you're working with a language like Python and Spark, it can be a little tricky. Sometimes you're working with a local pandas data frame that is not scaled out. Other times you're working with a scaled out one that's in Spark. So I like to keep them uh, clear, which is which. So I always like to prefix somehow with like an S for Spark and P for Python or pandas. So you can hear I'm going to bring this in. I'm going to call it SDF. Uh, it can say header true. I'm telling how to define it and it's going to infer the schema. So I'm doing the same thing we just did. I'm just doing this so I, I'm showing you. I could do this a number of ways, but now I'm going to use the Python method to create a data frame out of an external table like this. I'm gonna execute that. <clears throat> and you can see here, it comes back and gives me a description of what's in there, which is nice. Now, what if I wanna rename the columns the same way I did in SQL and I don't wanna use SQL to do it? Well, I can use again, the PySpark method. I can use select expression and then essentially very SQL-like. It's almost the same thing, right? I say pregnancies. Um, I can say change plasma glucose to just glucose change blood plasma to blood pressure, etc., And so I can do something very similar. And at the end, what I'm doing is I'm using this method called show so that you can see it really works. And then I'm gonna do this thing, print schema so you can see the, the new definition, put the new columns in. So I'm gonna run this. I'll do control enter so we can see the results right here. So the show does this and you can see it works with the names. And so I'm giving you a few extra takeaways here. Uh, the show command is a useful one because it will just pull out some of the results and display them. And here uh, I can use the print schema method to show us what's in there. So that's pretty cool. And you, some, one of the things also you wanna always make sure, okay, that really is a Spark data frame. It's telling us right here. And that's useful to know. It's, it's good to know when you're dealing with, as I mentioned, something scale up. That means that data frame is not in one place. It's scattered in partitions on multiple machines. So let's go back to thinking about pandas, which is the library for doing data frames in Python. And here I'm gonna say, I wanna use, I, I just thought this would be fun, so I kind of figured out how to do this. I wanna use the local blob storage, which Databricks gets when you create it in Azure automatically, and that's called DBFS. Now, interestingly, if, if you were up here, you'll notice it's one way of referring to it. Uh, up here, you can see file start, da, da, da. It doesn't refer to DBFS. But when you're doing it this way, I had to play around this a bit. You do have to say slash DBFS and then file store. And that tables is the default place it will load data. So whether or not you even complete the operation and define a table, it will still put it here by default. And then we can do pd.readcsv. So I'm gonna read directly against blob storage. This time, what's the difference? The difference is this. I'm creating a pandas, a local data frame, not a scaled out. So what's gonna happen is I'm only gonna bring the data, load it to the head node might want to do that. You're not going to get a lot of benefit from Spark at that point, but there are reasons why you would do that. Maybe if you want to do some open source visualizations or something on it. In this case, I'm going to then say, show me the columns, pd.columns. And you can see here, it just shows me the columns. And this is a pandas data frame. So that's the takeaway. So if you do want to load data directly, maybe start with a pandas data frame, do some things, and then push it into Spark, you could do that. Uh, if I want to look at a Spark data frame, now this is not a Spark function. This is actually a value added Databricks thing called display, which is really cool because when I use display, um, I get the feature functionality of this and I can even do graphics. If it was an aggregation or something, I could do things to play with the graphics and look at it. So it's really cool. Um, and again, I can, some things like we saw before, I could do the columns with PDF columns there. And you can see here, I can also use that on the Spark data frame little little different i think in the way it formatted it right yeah a little different formatting but you can see i was able to do pdf columns so that's the first takeaway is that when you're dealing with PySpark and you're doing sort of querying operations and data wrangling it, most of the time it's going to be almost identical or identical to what you would do in pandas so this is um good to know when it's different then you make it a little bit thrown and there are some differences one thing i've got a demo in here but i want to make sure i point out is Data frames in Spark are immutable. It's spread out among a cluster, so you can't just say, oh, add a column to it. You can create new columns, but you have to create a new data frame as well. So make sure when you're gonna, you wanna add columns and things or you know, do things like that, you have a, a different way of doing it than you could do it in 
uh, pandas. So we'll take a look at that as well. So we saw the show method, uh, but if we try the show with the PDF version, the local pandas, that's not a function. So if I try to do that and do control enter, it should get an error on the second one, but the first one works. So the first one, no problem. That's part of the PySpark interface. But you see here, it says, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Pandas don't support this. So you can't do that. Again, you got to play with this and, and try to get used to it. Um, if I don't want to use the show, I can also do this thing called take, which is really more of a, a, an RDD carryover. It's going to pull uh, the data out off of the data set and bring it, bring it in and it show it to me, uh, which is cool. And as we've seen, we can do the print schema as well. Uh, so print schemas here will show us what that looks like. Um, one thing you can also do is if you're going to use a data frame a lot, you can use the cache method, which will basically put it into the cache memory and retain it for you so that you can keep querying it and you'll get better performance instead of constantly losing it, reloading it. And also it's going to put it in the fastest memory available. So what I'm going to do here is cache this data frame. And then I'm going to use a function called drop NA. Now I'm not going to be able to you know, cover all the functionality available in PySpark. Uh, lots of links, this, this Spark documentation, this Databricks stuff, go look at it. What I'm trying to do here is just give you a feel for things and show you some of the more useful ones. Uh, take a copy of this notebook, and I think you'll find it useful as a starting point for your own, you know, moving forward. All right, so here I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new data frame, and I'm going to say drop NA, meaning any missing values, don't give me those rows. So I'm going to run this, control enter, and you can see here, you know, still got the, the whole thing here. Um, and I'll go over here now and say, okay, probably should, so we can say, this cell I'll just run so you can see it, SDF count. I wonder if we lost any though. So let me do this time. I'll say SDF dot no NA dot count. And uh, let me get rid of that period because it's not part of it. And let's see if, it, if we lost any rows by doing that. All right, I'm gonna pull this one out. 768 rows is what we have. So it doesn't look like it actually had any effect, but if it did, it would remove rows. And so if you don't want any data, you've got data and you said, just get rid of all rows that have NAs, null values in it. That's the way to do it. So another thing we can do with our, go back to our original SDF. We can, we can do a query where we group by age and do a count by age. And then we can say counts by age show. And what we're really doing is returning that as a data frame. So we can do that directly or we can do it this way. And now we can see, you know, we've got a summarization, how many by each age of a person. Uh, we've seen count already, so PDF count, uh, which is just going to return a count. Uh, that's local, so let's see if it works. So we can also do that count uh, on a data, a local data frame as well. So we've got that kind of functionality, which is kind of nice. So again, it's, it's pretty much the same. So I guess the takeaway from a lot of this is try the pandas approach with the Spark stuff, and it should work. But if it doesn't, then you know, look around, see what the different syntax required is. Um, here I'm going to create a new data frame. I'm going to use the Spark data frame. I'm going to use the PySpark method filter of that data frame. And here I'm going to say where the age is greater than 20. And then I can, you know, pandas likes, I can concatenate on another method, which is sort. And I'm going to sort by blood pressure. And then I'll just display the data set. That's it. So you got riveting stuff there, right? Uh, here I want to do something where I want to take NAs and just put these dashes instead. So if I, if I want to override, sometimes you want to do that, take NAs and put some other value, maybe zeros, maybe nine nines, maybe nulls, or whatever it is you're trying to override it, you can do that. All right, so we're going to look at a little more. This is exploring the data. Now, when you use data frames, data frames are not tables, and tables are not data frames. So there is some work you got to do to go between them. So if you create a data frame in, in Python or PySpark, it's not queryable using SQL immediately. But we can make it queryable by just uh, using a function such as the create or replace temp view. Now, this will create a table that's available during your session, but when you log off and come back the next day, it's gone, so you'll have to recreate it again. But let's see how it works. So we're going to say, again, this is a method hanging off of our data frame object, and this is the name of the table we want to create it as. Not a lot there, but now I should be able to query that table because I gave it a name with SQL. So this is great if I want to sort of pass things between them, especially this is ideal for that, 
in a single notebook. I don't really want to persist it permanently, but I want to be able to use it in SQL. That's a way to do that, and then I can go back and forth. Uh, so I can do that kind of stuff. Now, another thing I could do is I could say, no, I really want this to be permanent. So and I'm going back to the other data frame, which uh, was reformatting stuff before. But it's just another Spark data frame. I'm going to say write, and I'll say save as table. This time, not really going to show you the difference, but the big difference here, let me show I should have created this before. So if it worked, I should be able to not even run this query, and it should still be here. So let's see if it works. And it did. The reason is because I ran that before, and it's persisted permanently until I tell it otherwise. It's going to stay there. Little takeaway, though, with tables, so be careful. You need compute to use tables, um, which means you need clusters running, because remember, everything's in memory. So those tables will go away when the cluster goes away. The data behind it doesn't go away, nor does the meta structure. If you persisted it, it will still be there. So when you bring a cluster back up, you can have your tables come right back up with it, and you're good to go. Um, in Databricks and in Azure in general, all storage and compute are kept separate, which is awesome. Because what it means is you can terminate compute, which is expensive, like clusters, and you don't lose anything. You don't lose your notebooks. You don't lose anything you stored. Nothing. It's it's still there. So then we've got the write as table. So this is how you can persist it permanently. And we saw the here. Um, so let's look a little bit at something else. And this is SQL, but I'm going to plug for what I really love. I love this, this visualization. Really make use of it. You don't have to use Python and its visualizations all the time. It's great. So is R, all these things. It, it does awesome stuff. But you use what's there because this is built in. And you get this great thing. Uh, you can do plotting. So I can say, OK, maybe make this a bar chart. I can see it like that. And I can play around. I've got a lot of flexibility. I can say, yeah, maybe I want to. I don't have a lot to go with here. But maybe I want to say this. And I can change things around. So play with it. And you get a lot of functionality on that. It's, it's resizable. And don't forget, as well, you can also create dashboards and stuff. So a lot of good stuff there. Okay, more stuff here. I'm going to kind of, I don't know if I have anything special here, but trying to understand the data better. You might want to look at look at diabetes by age. And we can see something interesting here, which is really good. Don't assume too much. Uh, what I'm seeing here is a, a very skewed distribution here. So let's look at this for a minute. Looks like it would be uh, maybe the 22 age or something really skewed data set in terms of age. So we're not getting a very balanced data set, and that may make it difficult to get reliable predictions. Uh, here we can do, and I'm kind of emphasizing the SQL here, and I've got a whole presentation on SQL, but you can do case statements and all kinds of stuff. Um, I think I, I did this particularly because I wanted to drill down and say, what's going on in this data? And what you see here is people less than 30 makes up a huge amount of our data set. So we've got a lot of young people in here. If we're trying to identify type 2 diabetes, that could be a bit of an issue. So lots of good stuff, and that's certainly part of the process. Meanwhile, back to PySpark. So Spark SQL here. A really great way, my favorite takeaway way, to convert tables into data frames is actually to just use SQL. It's just, to me, the easiest way to do it. So I can just say spark.sql and then just put in my SQL statement. This is a defined table that we saw earlier we created. Um, and then we can do something like filter it as well. And then we can just show the data frame. And you can see here. Big takeaway, and I almost forgot to mention this, so I'm glad I put a note to myself here. Spark uses something called lazy execution. And what that means is, unless you ask for the data, it actually doesn't run the query, which is kind of a neat idea. So you could say, you know, query everything in the database, add this filter, sort, group, blah, blah, blah. Doesn't do a thing. So yeah. I don't trust you. You may not even want to run this. And I'm you got a petabyte of data here. I'm not going to run that unless you make me run it. So it's kind of like a little pass regression. No, it's, it's going to resist you for actually running. So I think that's a really great thing because what it can do is a few things. One, it can put a lot of operations together. It waits and it kind of constructs the ultimate query that it's going to run. And so it can do a lot of work in one pass. The other thing is, you know, suppose you're doing all this stuff and you actually never ask for the data. Well, it looks good, but if you don't, want to get the data for something, why bring it back? Why do all the work? All right, so what we're going to do here is we're going to use Spark SQL, and we want to bring it back. We're going to force that lazy executor to execute. And we're going to do that by using the collect method. So very cool. So we're going to take our Spark SQL, and then we're just going to append this collect afterwards. And collect says, when you're done running this query, 
collect the data from all those nodes and bring it back to the head cluster. Now, warning, danger, danger, Will Robinson from <laughs> Lost in Space. Warning, if you don't have a lot, of, if you got a lot of data coming back, you can crash the head node. So do not do this with a petabyte of data. Do not even do this with a terabyte of data. It's probably too much. A few megabytes, you're probably okay. So just be really careful when you do that. Spark is designed to massively scale. It's not designed to do local work. It will let you do that, and it's great to some level. But if you're doing that all the time, you're probably not on the right platform. And I would talk when you talk to something like uh, this, just be aware that you, you're bringing stuff back. However, having said all that warnings, I'm going to show you a great use case why you might want to do that. Let's assume you love matplotlib, and you want to do a plot here. So let me... Make sure I run this first thing so I get my data set because I think I'm using that. No, maybe not, but I'll run it anyway. Control Enter. You can see that. And hopefully I can run this and it works. It's much better when code works. All right. So to be honest, I don't get into this diagram too much. It was just something to show. But what I want to use, I want to use matplotlib locally. So I can import matplotlib and go in here and I can use this plot display function. So the takeaway here is if I want to do graphics or some library that's only available in open source and I really love it, have at it. Just bring it local. And, you know, you can use, in this case, uh, I'm taking that Spark data frame and I'm using the two pandas method. So big takeaway here, two pandas. It will convert a Spark data frame out there into one data frame in a cohesive piece, which can then be used by the open source libraries. All right. So let's look at some other things. What about when we want to add a new column? This is where it's going to get a little weird. Um, and the reason is because, as I mentioned, data frames are immutable when they're in Spark, Spark data frames. So we don't, instead of the traditional way we might do this in, uh, say, pandas, which you can see, I believe, here, we're going to use this with column method. There's several ways to do this. So I'm just going to show you one way, but go look at the documentation. There's other ways. I like the with column because, personally, I think it's sort of self-documenting. Um, so we get this creating a new column called h2 and I'm going to use the h column and I'm going to say as type string. So what I'm doing here is actually just converting the column type, but I could be doing a calculation. I think I have something, I do have something further that does that, but I'm adding a new column h2. Then I'm going to drop the original h column and I'm going to print the schema. So let's watch this. What's the biggest takeaway here though is I'm creating a brand new data frame. I have to create a new data frame. Sometimes I think the immutability thing is a little overemphasized because it's just easy to create a new data frame. It's not really the end of the world. It's not a, it doesn't have to be a massive operation. It can, it's pretty, it's efficient and it works great. So it's not a big deal. You just have to be aware it's happening. You can't modify it. Um, an in-place uh, data frame that's a Spark data frame. So you can see it here and you can see my new H2 column. All right, and this would be a way you could do something in pandas where you're going to do something where I'm going to calculate years over minor and just basically I want to say how long has it been since this person was actually uh, a minor. And so I'm just crude calculation saying minus 16 on their age. And let me run that. So here I'm also doing a copy. I'm creating a new data frame and then I'm taking that data frame and I can add the column directly and then do a head statement. So this is kind of a, a sort of way of doing things in pandas. It's a local pandas data frame that I couldn't do uh, the same way if I wanted to do that in Spark. What I can do is this, again, back to my with column. And again, I'm creating a new data frame uh, returned from the STF. And I'm going to say the age minus 16. And you can see that you know it's doing that years over. So it's years since 16. So if I was uh, you know two years, so if I was 18, it's only been two years, that kind of thing. So I run the same thing here, and now it's uh, it's showing me that it's it's showing me the years over minimum. So I'm getting the years over being a minor, getting the same result, just a slightly different way of coding. All right. Another thing you can do, which I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about, and I haven't done a huge amount with these myself yet, but I do want to talk about them, which is user-defined functions. User-defined functions are really efficient, and they're kind of using PySpark, but they're going directly to the heart of Spark because they're calling uh, functions, the SQL functions, and letting you create your own function and push that function out to the nodes. So it's really powerful. And I'm just creating my own little Lambda function really here, and I'm using it as a UDF function here. I'm creating this, and I'm going to give it a name, and then I'm going to 
do the with column we mentioned, but now I'm going to use it as a function, and that function is going to be pushed out to the nodes. It's not a good use case. I don't need to do this in this case, but maybe I have, this could be a def function just as easily in Python, and it could have some pretty complex code. And by using UDF, I could push it out as well. So let me run that. And I, I got that here. And you can just see, you know, it did it, and I've got my years minor. So again, it's not a good use case. The real takeaway I just want you to get in, understand is that we can create functions and then we can use those kind of like SQL functions. Like if you're a SQL server, you can have function and store it and then use it within SQL. But in this case, we're creating functions that we can call from within our, um, our Python logic and it will push that function out. So it's uh, pretty cool. So again, we saw this before, but again, if we want to take a, uh, a new DF, I don't know if I actually have this created and convert it into a, a local Python data frame. I do have it. Uh, you can do that. So that's all this did. It just uses the two pandas. So if you remember nothing else, remember two pandas, because I have a feeling you'll find it pretty useful. And then once I've done that, we'll get this amazing data frame. When you do uh, the describe command will give us basically sort of like a summary of statistics on something. Uh, but by default, it will not do any statistics on string columns or things. It only works with numeric columns. And you can see that here. All right. And again, PySpark functions, SQL functions import. I can, if I bring in the PySpark SQL functions, then I can call SQL functions directly. So I'm using the select and then I can do these different functions within it. And again, it's, it's going to be very performant. And for some reason, I don't have my df2 let me oh i think i need to change this to sdf2 so let me run that yeah sorry so this should have been sdf for, for the scale out okay um another way i can do collect is i can just say select asterisk so i want to take the entire set of data select it and bring it local and in this case i'm just returning it and i keep forgetting i changed it to sdf so i knew when it was doing that run that again and you get that you can see it's returning the rows. Okay. All right. Now we're going to get into a little bit about MLlib and scaling out. I took this. It's, a, it's somebody else's example from the notebook, so I'm not going to get into a lot of it. I just wanted to kind of cover it. So there's a, we're going to have to bring in the, the ML uh, library function, vector assembler. And the vector is basically just an array of data. And here we can say, what columns do we want to use here? And we've got it going on we can which saying transform the SDF and it's going to return it into a training data set so run that it's good to go we can we can see our training data set great the idea here is we're getting our features into a model now let's display the training data set okay now we want to take the diabetes column and make that our label because that's the that's the thing we're going to be predicting right we want to know if somebody get diabetes and we can see we've done that now and so we can do that using the uh, with columns renamed. And then we're going to print the schema out again. And now we're going to build a model. So now we've got our training set. We've got these libraries we're going to want to bring in. And you can see these are all ML library things, classification, etc. So we're going to start with this, bring in the libraries we need. And we're doing a decision tree classifier, returning that into DT putting all uh, the evaluation together, uh, setting up the, the C, the max bins, how do we want to group it, et cetera. And the main, again, the takeaway, I'm not going to get into all the code. I need to look at more closely. The main point here is that this is a way you could do um, using a decision tree classifier, which is part of the ML lib, to do scale out. And the main takeaway is it's scaled out to the nodes. It's not doing this just locally. And then we can take this and split the data. We're doing TVSS. We're going to split the data. TBS. Um, we're doing a seed train. So we're taking a ratio up here. Uh, we want to get 70% on one side and pull it out, it looks like. And now we're going to do, we're going to fit our model. Okay, so here's where we're actually going to fit the model. And now that we've fitted the model, we can do an, like evaluate the model. How did it do? Like, how does it look? So we've got some numbers here. 
not doing a lot for me on the Decembers, but uh, I typically like to see something a little more on this. Um, but now what I can do is take the model, and I can write that in sets. My best, call it best model, I'm going to write. I can save it, basically. That's that's the takeaway. By running Control enter here, it's going to run that, and it's saving it to disk. And I can tell because if I go here, it's showing it written to disk. So I know if you're saying, well, aren't you going to explain more about what it's doing in training the model and, and how to evaluate the model? And I'm not really going to get into that here. Maybe at a future deep dive, I'll do something focused strictly on MLlib and looking at it. But the takeaway really on the model training is if you know how to do model training, then it's the same thing. You're going to, I've got a link. It's pointing you to the uh, Apache Spark documentation. So be careful to get the latest version. If you're going to be, you know, going in new to this, you know, you might as well use the latest, greatest. And you can see, you know, up at the, the up here is the, the PySpark grouping. So you've got the SQL module, the streaming module, the ML module, ML live module, uh, and all that stuff. And it, there's a lot of functions and things like that. So you could be here a long time. So kind of play with it and build out your knowledge like anything, you know, kind of take time. But you can see the supported API, uh, ML is more for pipelines and the ML live is for machine learning models. And take advantage of anything available. Try not to write code from scratch. If you're new to programming, or especially, you, you'll learn that programmers never write new code. <laughs> you, know, you copy, you clone, you steal, you skeleton programs. You, you always want to start with something that's written. And the reason for that is you know, syntax errors are so easy to get into, and it's, it's easier to take code and then tweak it to what you need. It saves you a lot of time. So there's some links here. Go out. There's, there's some available sample data uh, notebooks that you can pull in and resources. So take a look at those. A lot of good stuff out there. A lot of stuff on GitHub, too. People create things. And within um, Databricks, you can import not just Databricks notebooks, but you can also import IPython notebooks and uh, things like that. So you you got a lot of uh, stuff out there you can play with. So that's it for a uh, discussion of this. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Please subscribe, please share, you know, let people know about this. It's, you know, it's good to get a lot of people uh, getting this value of training and stuff out there. I've gotten some great comments and I really appreciate that from people. But this is awesome stuff and I'm building out more than any other area. I'm building out my Databricks side of things because I see there's, a, there's just not enough documentation training, et cetera, to go around. And it's, I think it's like the hottest thing on Azure right now. Big data, machine learning, AI, I mean, what more could you ask for? It's, it's awesome. So until next time, thank you.